The following is quoted from the history of the three judges of Charles I. I am loath to admit an anecdote handed down through Governor Leverett's family. I find Joff takes notice in his journal of Leverett's being at Hadley. The town of Hadley was alarmed by the Indians in 1675 in the time of public worship, and the people were in the utmost confusion. Suddenly, a grave elderly person appeared in the midst of them. In his mien and dress, he differed from the rest of the people. He not only encouraged them to defend themselves, but he put themselves at their head, rallied, instructed, and led them on to encounter the enemy, who by this means were repulsed. As suddenly, the deliverer of Hadley disappeared. The people were left in consternation, utterly unable to account for this strange phenomenon. It is not probable they were ever able to explain it. It's just the uh, TV5. Um, Here, lo would you like local to be cable. Would you like to do a tour? You know, why don't you ask Ellie and all the people that would be responsible for doing all of this? Yeah. They would love to do well, that. I'm asking everybody. Oh, are you really? Okay. Yeah. It's the most enjoyable program. I mean, Jim Freeman is an excellent speaker. He's was a wonderful program. How do you feel about that? Don't you think it was good? What? The program? Yes. It was fantastic. Okay, what's your name? Uh, Joe Peelish. And yeah. you live in Hadley? Uh, no, but I was born in Northampton, lived in Hadley, went to school in the Hadley school systems, and uh, graduated Hopkins Academy. How did you like tonight's talk? Oh, I thought it was just, it was excellent. I think Jim is uh, just uh, an authority on many, many phases of history, especially the town history. My name is Diane Bai, Betty Faulkner. And how did you like the talk? We loved it. We loved it. It was very interesting. We learned a lot about the Angel of Hadley. Are you, are you into local history? Uh, yes. Yeah. I am a member of the Historical Society, and Betty is too. Yeah, you too. Hey, what do you think, um, what's the best reason to join the Historical Society? To learn the history of Hadley and to see our collection and continue to expand our collection. Okay, what's your name? My name is Judy Pellis. And how did you like tonight's talk? I loved Jim's talk. It was great. I learned a lot. And it was a great history because my husband and myself were very interested in the different parts of history. Great. So, what do you two think? Did the Angel of Hadley incident happen or not? Yes, I think it did. Yeah. What do you think? I don't think it did. I thought it did. Oh, well, hopefully you... I don't think it did. Mm -hmm. It kept going through all these things. I don't know. I don't think that. I don't think there was an angel. I have to read more about it. I haven't read the book. That's why I came to this lecture tonight. Well, hopefully it won't come between you. Um, no, 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 no. We're, we're good friends. We're good friends. So, so what do you think? Do you think that the angel of Hadley actually happened? It brings a lot of questions to me now. And I sort of, uh, after just listening to Jim, uh, uh, puts in my mind questionable whether there really was an angel. So what do you think? Do you think the Angel of Hadley incident happened? I think so. <laughs> I do. I always did, and I still do. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you. It's one yes. So tell me, ladies, what do you think? Did the Angel of Hadley incident happen or not? I like to believe it did. She likes to believe it did. Um, factually, no, it didn't. <laughs> Myth or legend? And what do you think? Well, considering how messed up uh, history is, uh, it could go either way. Okay, well, hopefully, even though you disagree, it won't come between you. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I interrupted my sleep schedule. So I plan to take something away from you. <clears throat> 
All of you sit here, and I'd like to ask one question to begin with. How many of you ever talked about yourself and sort of embroidered what you did? Or talked about your family, your kids, your parents, your town? Have any of you ever embroidered the facts? One guy. <laughs> this will be over early this evening. Okay. Uh, you may know the uh, New Testament saying uh, from Gospel of John. Uh, know the truth, it'll make you free. And that may be true, but the trouble is, truth and what we want to be true are two very separate things. Uh, three, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greeks said, there are facts. You hold a rock in your hand, you drop it, it falls. That's a fact. Fact everywhere, from Hadley to Hong Kong. Then there's belief. There's facts, and then there's beliefs. And that, uh, some people laugh when I talk about my closest belief. I, I'm accompanied all the time by a six-foot white rabbit who's invisible, but Harvey keeps me company. That's my belief. Nobody can check it or anything like that. So we have facts and belief, and that's what we're going to start off with today. This, as you know, is a well-known picture of the General Goff uh, rallying us Hadley people to repel the Red Savages. Okay, if you click the next one. A lot of times, when you find out the truth, it isn't pleasant. <laughs> I must say that when I talked at Amherst, several people from Hadley came loaded for bear because for them, the myth of the angel of Hadley is true. And when I suggested maybe it wasn't, uh, they came after me with those uh, assault weapons we hear about. But anyway, you pay a price. But let's uh, remember what American history we know and realize it's a always a mixture of few facts and a lot of embroidery. I'd like to talk about some American uh, stories that we accept. Oh, they're not true. Click the next one, Carolina, if you would. Now, remember Nathan Hale? Most of these stories came from the 1770s when our nation was young, and we needed heroes. We didn't want old world heroes, we wanted new world heroes. So here's Nathan Hale. He was a young school teacher. Uh, from Connecticut, and he was carrying uh, documents. The British caught him and rightly hung him because he was a spy. Do you remember what Nathan Hale supposedly said before he died? I only regret that I have one more to give my contract. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> my work is done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, isn't that inspiring? Ah. <laughs> he was first quoted as saying that 75 years after his death. <laughs> there, were British, there were British officers standing there, and some took down shorthand notes saying he was very noble and brave and things like that. He never said it. What have we done with Nathan Hale? <laughs> Put him on a stamp. And Americans have given him the ultimate praise of the next one. <laughs> So he may have never said it, but we want to believe it. There's another myth. You've got the idea. A little fact, a lot of fiction. Remember that bell? Do you know which bell that is? The Liberty. Exactly. And here's a story, uh, illustration from a story in a 19th century magazine. The old bell keeper has been waiting for years. And when the Declaration of Independence is signed, he finally rings the bell. He's so happy. Except the Liberty Bell was never even called that till 1823, <laughs> and that's because the people in Philadelphia were interested in abolition or freeing the slaves. And so this is a fantasy, and yet we put it in the moon. Next slide. Recognize the gentleman? <laughs> I, 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 no, I thought it was on the North Hadley. True, Washington did cross the Delaware to Trenton. In a barge. Yeah, not only in a barge, but do you see anything that perhaps isn't historical? A historian went through it and found 13, get it? 13 errors. Why? Because Washington crossed in 1775. This picture was painted in 1850 by a German named Emanuel Leutze. He commuted between the United States and Germany. And if you know anything about the history of Europe, in 1848, nations rose up. They wanted to show, uh, throw away hereditary princes. They wanted to get rid of the Pope. 
Sometimes they were successful, oftentimes they weren't. But Leutze was so encouraged by the fact that we'd thrown off the idea of a church and a hereditary ruler that he wanted to glorify Washington. This was propaganda for Germans. And, well, and other people, the Italians followed too. But anyway, as you notice, these, just to point out one thing, ice like that, it's fine on the Rhine River, but uh, in New Jersey. <laughs> anyway, this uh, motif, next one. As you may know, in 1940, the daughters of the American Revolution refused to let uh, um, Marian Mary Anderson. Anderson. See, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Anderson sing because she was a Negro person. This painting by Grant Wood shows that the women's bigotry is based on a fantasy as fragile as their teacups. It's a very political picture. Okay, next slide, please. Did that stop any of us? No? There's the New Jersey, New Jersey coin, exactly. Uh, this is bad voting habits, as you know. Okay, you get the picture. Little fact, a lot of fantasy. Next one, please. Uh, the last one, Marlo Miller can't be here, but uh, some of you know Marlo's work uh, studying Betsy Ross and our flag. This is elegant. If you've ever been to the house that Betsy supposedly lived in, in Philadelphia, you know, it's a little shack, maybe as big as this room. Here, the story came out about, uh, let's say, 70 years after the supposed fact. It was a relative of a nephew of her grandson who said, oh, she made the flag for Washington. Washington came to visit her and so on. Absolute fantasy. It is a good chance to see how elegantly uh, people dress and uh, how noble Betsy was. She was a, an upholsterer, always on the edge of starvation and so on. The story that uh, inspires this painting is 60, 70 years later. Okay, moving right along. Ah, whoops. Here's a factual picture. <laughs> this is the Angel of Hadley. Do, most of you know the story, correct? Supposedly, on the 1st of September, 1675, or other date, uh, the good people of Hadley were terrified. Uh, the native Nipmucks were raging up and down the valley. Somehow they didn't appreciate being invaded, although we, we were good Christian capitalists and decided to take their land and their religion away. They resented it. I don't understand those people, do you? But anyway, they were up and down the valley. They'd attacked Northampton, Deerfield, and Hatfield. Who's from Hatfield here? Yeah, a couple of years from Hatfield. They'd attacked them. And the good people of Hadley went to their meeting house, what they called a church. All of a sudden, an old man with a long white beard and outmoded clothing shows up, says, the Indians are attacking. He may have called them savages, that is, people who live in the silver of the woods. He may have called them heathen, that is, people who live on the open heath. He may have called them villains, people who live in little shacks, Belete. Or he may have called them uh, barbarians because they don't speak English. Or he may have called them miscreants, unbelievers, uh, believers in the wrong thing. Uh, and don't forget, prejudice was accepted and required, and tolerance was a vice. Anyway, he led the attack against, the counterattack against the Indians, drove them away, and then he disappeared. And people were so excited, they said an angel had visited them. And once again, it showed that God was taking care of his chosen people. As we'll soon see, the people who lived here believed they were like Old Testament Hebrews. Let us remember the Hebrews had been promised by Yahweh, the land of Canaan. When the Hebrews got there, Canaanites were living there, and the Hebrews got permission to slaughter them. That's the beginning of genocide, uh, with God's approval. The people who lived in Hadley felt the same way. It was their right to take the land. Anyway, the natives disagreed. Well, let's see what we can make of this story. The story of the Angel of Hadley begins much before 1675 or thereabouts. Next slide. This is what he looks like. Probably much pretty up, and certainly with a long <laughs> white beard and the long hair. I envy him. I keep telling my barber. <laughs> he's, 
he says, Jim, you know every hair on your head by name. They get serious about it. Anyway, this is William Goff. And in your hands, I've given you the facts you know, if you click the next uh, slide. These are the facts we know, and they've been documented in various ways, from uh, church registers, from official histories, from state the calendar, state papers, domestic, and so on. He was born roughly 1610 in Sussex, England. He married uh, the daughter of Edward Whaley, whom he should soon would be a uh, fugitive with, and he was related to Oliver Cromwell, whom you soon hear about. He was the absolute leader in the middle of the 17th century of the Puritan faction. Uh, he was a zealous Puritan preacher. He hated uh, Quakers, for example, thought they should be executed right on the spot. But that was the day. He was a great army commander. He served at Dunbar, especially. Now, we're getting into the, what made Goff unpopular. He and 58 other judges authorized the execution of Charles I in 1649. Don't worry about remembering this, although there may be a quiz. I'll show you pictures <laughs> later on. We'll, we'll marinate in pictures. But anyway, uh, and they justified this by saying Charles was not a king. He was a tyrant. Get it? Not a king who has rights, but a tyrant who has no rights. Anyway, Charles II's... Uh, the son of Charles I came back in 1660. The Puritans fell out of power. And one of the first things Charles II wanted to do is meet these judges who condemned his father. And I'll show you pictures of the, the entertainment that Charles gave them. Finally, uh, we're, we're starting to come in. Goff fled to America with his father-in-law, Whaley, and another man named John Dixwell. If you've been down in New Haven, you know three of the main streets are Dixwell, Whaley, and Goff. Um, he found shelter first in Cambridge, in Boston, then New Haven, and finally up here in Hadley. And he stayed in a secret room of Parson John Russell's house on West Street. You know where the memorial uh, boulder is, where Carver's used to be. That's where John Russell's house was. And I'll show you what the hiding place looked like. He lived in the secret room. And then finally, the last thing we really know is that he wrote coded letters uh, under the name of Goldsmith to his wife in England. He never again saw her. We're so fortunate we have a God of the Bible that uh, uh, William Goff used while he was hiding with Parson Russell right around the corner there. And the sad thing is what gets me is the Old Testament book of, uh, of uh, Song of Songs or Canticles if you're Catholic, Song of Solomon. It's a love song. It's about sexual love. Uh, that's the most consulted part of the whole Bible. <laughs> anyway, let's... Uh, this, this is the story of what brings William Goff to our town. Uh, you know, in the 1520s, Martin Luther decided, uh, for various reasons, that this man-made bureaucracy of the Roman Catholic Church was not good theology. It was a great money maker for Rome. It was a good instrument of control. But he said, no, there's no bureaucracy. There's no um, uh, chain of command. Human beings are alone in the universe with God. That's it. There's nobody in between. If you're a good Catholic, you have a problem. You go to the priest, you go to the bishop, you go to the archbishop, you go to the cardinal, you go to the pope. For the Protestants, there's none of this. It's you and God. Anyway, this is a... Uh, a wonderful uh, caricature. We don't know if it's for or against the new Lutherans. It may be by the Lutherans against the Catholic Church. Notice this is a monk. He has the, the shaving, the tonsure. Right? Or it really looks like Luther. Of course, my family is all German. Every Heine looks alike. But, uh, it may be this is Catholic propaganda against Luther. Remember, he used his new freedom to marry a former nun. And the bagpipe was a Renaissance emblem of the male sexual organs. And so this may be a real insult. Either way, you get the idea there was hostility to begin with between the Protestants and the Catholics. It doesn't stop there. <laughs> Henry VIII decided that uh, he was tired of paying taxes to Rome. About a third of the land in England was owned by the church. And the church didn't have to obey civil law and things like that. Also, frankly, Henry VIII wanted to get married, and the price that the Pope asked was too high to annul his other marriage. So Henry VIII broke from the Catholic Church. 
and establish a church in England. It seemed a safe thing to do, but what happens is, uh, alternating throughout the 16th century, were after Henry VIII, Mary came, and she was Catholic. So she executed at least 300 Protestants. Is this clear for you? <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just all right? <laughs> Yeah, sure, all right. Okay, uh, I'd like to show you some atrocity pictures right before your bedtime. Uh, religion should inspire us. It inspired them, but it's to hurt other people who weren't in your group. These are Protestants being killed by Catholics. On the continent, this is... Uh, Catholics being killed by Protestants, I think. What difference does it make? <laughs> uh, you can see people being skinned, for example, and roasted and so on. Should we leave this up for a while? <laughs> no, no, let's pass up. In the middle of the century, Queen Elizabeth in England said, this has got to stop. I will be head of a state church called the Anglican, the English church. Okay? In that way, both your faith and your patriotism are guaranteed. Well, that seemed like a reasonable solution, except, remember the Protestants are all alone in the universe. The only avenue they have to God is through the Bible. The Bible was allowed to be translated into their own language. Uh, the good part was that women had to be taught to read. Or if you, maybe you think that's a good idea, I don't know. We can debate that later. But anyway, <laughs> Protestants demanded that both men and women have high literacy rates. Here is the famous Geneva Bible, right around the corner, printed in Geneva when uh, the Protestants were sort of out in England. And down at the bottom, it shows Pharaoh's chariots coming and his army to attack the Hebrews who were about to cross the Red Sea. In front of them is Yahweh. Remember, he's fire at night and smoke in the day. The Hebrews, as we know, are going to escape across the water and get rid of these military uh, miscreants. Guess what the separatists, Puritans, and other Protestants thought? That was them. This is the story of their history, done in the past, that they're going to do today. They, uh, the people who weren't happy with Elizabeth settlement, went across to Holland first, and then another big body of water, the ocean, and came here. Okay. Now, to have the Bible seem, yeah, please. To have the Bible seems great, except, as John Calvin said, as many readers, that many interpretations. Here's what people did to the Bible. This is a Jesuit, this is a, a Brownist, one of the many Protestant sects, and these are two other Protestant sects. Everyone used the Bible saying, I'm right, you're wrong. And you know how it is. You can prove anything from uh, words, sentences, images. Another one, please. And so, using the Bible didn't unite people. Here's some of the many, these are Protestant sects. My favorite is the Adamites. What's missing from him? Yeah, the Adamites said, we are so good that we are like pre-fallen human beings. We don't have to wear clothes. Which is a little odd in England, if you've ever been there. You know, <laughs> and so on. Anyway, these are all different sects. All of them read the same Bible. And so, you know, in some of our hearts, you thought maybe it was right, let the Catholic Church do it, tell you what you're supposed to believe, and stop all this do it yourself business. Whatever the right or wrong, the fact is this there was turmoil both in and out of the country. Next one. Now, civil war broke out. Essentially, between the more conservative people who believed in the king and the new city people who were more highly educated um, and uh, believed that the king had no right. This is the king's nephew, Prince Rupert. It's a, a Puritan uh, caricature of him. In other words, fairness, tolerance, understanding, mediation, none of that had any value in this world. Next one. Well, it came to this. This is the famous death warrant. Can you read it? Warrant, Charles I, 1640. It's really 49. The calendar changed. Anyway, um, here's Oliver Cromwell's signature. Down below that, I couldn't get it on the screen, is uh, Goff's. 
and then Whaley's is somewhere. Uh, and they were as good as they were. The king had been tried, and he was executed. You can see his head being held up here. He had to creep out the window there in his undershirt and was executed in front of this big crowd. Beheading is an effective way to remove an unpopular leader. However, next one. Oliver Cromwell took over and it seemed that maybe Elizabeth's tree was going to be realized. And the people who um, had supported him had this magnificent picture. He has a sword in one hand, a book in the other. He's trampling on error, who's dropped a rosary beneath. Here's uh, England, Scotland, and Wales. No, this is Ireland. Uh, and that's St. Andrew's Cross, Scotland. And what else? I think. Anyway, all these have meaning that somehow this order's been restored. Right. It was restored for about nine years. And then the memory of Charles I came back. People didn't forget. There were a lot of high church people, <coughs> Anglican people, and there were a lot of crypto Catholics who kept to the old faith. They made Charles into a saint, not sort of some sort of uh, socially awkward person. And here, we could read this for half an hour, but you get the idea. He is in the posture of first King David in the Old Testament, and secondly, Jesus in the garden. And other, isn't this great propaganda? And all of these things have meaning. The point is that he shouldn't have been executed. Along in 1660 comes Charles the first son. Slightly different from Oliver Cromwell. His taste in puppies, you may object to, but he well, had lived in France. Uh, he did one thing for art. He brought women actresses on the stage for the first time, and the stage opened up because the Puritans had closed down the theaters. Anyway, one of the first things that Charles wanted to do is meet the judges who signed the death warrant for uh, his father. Uh, here is uh, Harrison, uh, uh, Major Harrison, uh, how he was treated by Charles. First he was drawn in a sledge, then he was hung till he's almost dead, and then he's taken down, his guts are pulled out, burned on a fire, his heart is ripped out, and then he's torn into four parts. His name was uh, John Harrison, and he was one of the 59 judges. So You see what I'm leading up to? Why did William Goff leave England? Well, he could have stayed. <laughs> the point is, is this horrific or is it not? But it's all under the guise of religion. As we know, religion excuses a lot of horrors. It was going on with the English, who often looked down on the superstition and savagery of those on the continent. Here it's breaking out in their own country. Well, where was Goff going to go? Uh, the Netherlands, Holland, was too tolerant a place for the Puritans. Remember, uh, a number of them had lived there, and they didn't like the idea that everybody was treated equally. And they came to this country. Here's the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Company. And it, it again, was like selling land in Florida. The Indian is quoting uh, acts, come over and help us. I'm sure a lot of Indians said that. <laughs> anyway, everything grows in this land. And this friendly, though dark-skinned, creature uh, was the welcoming committee. Uh, people did come to New England and uh, they found that uh, a number of the natives did not want to be expropriated. Just think to yourself, what are the towns around here? Hatfield, Deerfield, and so on. Those were Indian fields. The myth among the white people was, no, these were rovers in the forest, savages, or they lived in an empty space and under English law an empty house, Domus Wapus, or uh, an empty space, uh, uh, Terra Wasta. But you could take over. That's not the Indian understanding. The white men knew that. What, what the heck? They had muskets. Okay, the next slide. God comes here, ends up in Hadley. Remember, first he goes to Boston, then to New Haven, and then up to uh, up the valley. Here is, as you notice, here's the dike. Here's West Street, and here's the other end. This is our wonderful mile-long, uh, four-tree shaded, yeah. 
And then this is the street where Reverend Russell's house was. I remember Carver's was here. This is West Street. This is where the house was. It's just that boulder there. Someday when you can pull off the road and look at it, and I'll show you a picture soon. Up the road lived, uh, this is uh, Philip Smith, and uh, anyway, there were other people along here who were sympathetic. And when Goff got to Hadley, about 1661, maybe in the fall, say October. Yeah, don't pass out yet, Carolina. <laughs> it's young yet. The uh, angel hid in this chamber behind the kitchen. You know what the irony is? In England, during the Protestant ascendancy in the 16th century, there were what they called priest holes for old, you've heard of them, for old believers. So that when the, pre, the family priest was in danger, he could hide there. Now what's happening? The same thing is happening in a Protestant area for a Protestant. But William Goff had to be there. Charles II had sent out uh, skip tracers, bounty hunters, uh, I don't know what you call them, purse rebounds, uh, to track him down. And he lived in this place till the end of his life. Apparently, uh, Whaley died. It may be that Goff moved on. We don't know. That's on the, you know, the other side of our sheet, the facts that we don't know. Okay, if we could...